Well, welcome. It's raining, so when it rains in this city, things start later or people come later. But let's start. We have to stop in time. The, um, the discussion will be in English, as it was said in the, in the web, at CDOP web. Uh, well, welcome here at CDOP. Thank you, Maura, Ramon, Zaika, and Lefteris for having come to CIDOP and to Barcelona. This is the first, set, the first seminar of a set of six seminars we are organizing together with Palau Macaya. This set of seminars, which will take place from today till February 2018, aims to open a space for dialogue and reflection between the different actors involved in asylum and uh, refugee reception policies. In each of these seminars, we will discuss similar questions. Basically, what has been done, what is being done, and what could be done differently. But we will discuss them from different perspectives or at different administrative levels. So at the local, today, at the regional, at the national, and at the European level, but also at the level of NGOs and civil society organizations. It's not a coincidence that we start the discussion with cities. They have no competence in asylum, so at first sight it might, it might seem weird to start with cities, but they are the ones, cities are the ones dealing with the consequences, dealing more directly with immigration, and dealing more directly with the arrival of asylum seekers and their integration. The so-called refugee crisis in Europe has been, above all, a policy crisis. The Dublin system has proved to fail. In fact, it was already acknowledged for years. Schengen has also been under fired. In fact, we could say that if Dublin doesn't work, Schengen doesn't work either. It has also been a policy crisis in the sense that many countries, in many countries, accommodation facilities were not in place or could not cope with the arrival of asylum seekers. And finally, which is not a policy crisis as such, but it's rather a solidarity crisis, member states are not even complying with their own commitments in terms of relocation quotas. So in this context, we would like to discuss what cities have done and what cities are doing. The academic literature on immigration and integration policies at the local level, which is growing in the last decade, argues that cities tend to be much more inclusive than national states, that they are much more inclined or in favor to provide immigrants with equitable opportunities to accommodate ethnic diversity or to work with immigrant organizations. So a key question here is, how does this supposed or alleged inclusiveness of cities translate in the field of asylum and uh, refugee reception policies? The second set of questions we would like to discuss today is what cities, or what, what cities could do, or what could be done differently? In his famous book, if mayors rule the world, Benjamin, uh, the sociologist Benjamin Barber argues that cities and the mayors that run them offer the best new forces of good governance. He, Barber, gives many examples and many reasons why this is so, or he argues that this is so, but in the field of migration, he argues that this has to do with the fact that cities are unburdened with the issues of borders and sovereignty, which is precisely what prevents, according to him, what prevents states from looking for real solutions as well as from working with one another. So cities, and here I'm following Barber's argument, cities are unburdened with issues of borders and sovereignty. And I would add 
that cities are burdened, and maybe more than any other uh, state authority, with issues of social inequalities, social cohesion, and basically, to put it simply, about, about all those issues that have to do with living together. So coming back to Barber's words, if cities rule the world, if it could be up to you to decide what could be done differently. To discuss all these issues, which are not uh, small, uh, it's really many things and many challenging uh, issues, we have invited representatives of four European cities, Athens, Vienna, Barcelona, and Milan. Lefteris, let me introduce them very shortly, and then we start the discussion. The discussion. Lefteris Papagianakis is first deputy mayor and head of refugee and immigration affairs at municipality of Athens. He is a member of the Athens Municipal Council and president of the Immigrant Integration Council. He was born in France and studied in France, and he also worked at the European Parliament. Faika El Nagashi, she is a member of the Vienna Provincial Parliament and of the Vienna City Council. She has been working on anti-racist and anti-discrimination issues since the mid-90s, and she is still a political activist, but also became a politician uh, within the Vienna Green Party. Ramon Sanauja, many of you may know him. Since 2007, he is the Director of Immigration and Interculturality of the Barcelona City Council. So to say it uh, straightforward, he has been behind Barcelona's migration and intercultural policies almost from the beginning. Uh, in the last years, he is also responsible for the new plan for irregular settlements and also for the pioneering refugee attention protect, uh, project Nausicaa, which I think he will explain to us. And finally, Maura Gambarana, she is the Chief Officer of the Foreign and Immigration Department of the City Council of Milan. She has been working in the municipality of Milan for 28 years. She has been the Director of the International Affairs Office, and then she decided to shift to uh, policies uh, dealing more directly with immigration as a way to work more directly with uh, social issues and uh, social processes. So let's start the discussion. Instead of asking them to present uh, their uh, cases, their cities, their policies, we decided to articulate it as a discussion. So I will be posing questions and we will continue till the end. We will open as well at the end the floor for uh, discussion. So the first question I would like to pose you is what are the main challenges of your municipalities what are the main challenges your municipalities have to respond to in the area of immigration in, gener in general? So maybe we can follow the same order, if that is. Mm, yes, hi, uh, thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, for us, I would like also to just to start by saying that you have four cities, and I believe that we have four different systems, mm -hmm. four different um, you know, state of minds, and uh, four different sets of possibility and capacities. Um, for Athens, one of the biggest challenges is to find solutions concerning housing, because in, in Athens and in Greece in general, housing will be the next big issue. Not that we don't have space, but we don't have the framework to, to do it. For example, we cannot build social housing uh, in Athens. We don't have that mandate. So this is one big challenge, and the next, the, the first big challenge is, in a general sense, integration. We have been dealing with migrants for more than 30 years in Athens, but unfortunately the Greek state and the municipality, I don't want to uh, take us out of this uh, equation, uh, we haven't dealt with migration in a very serious way. I mean, we have plans and strategies who are very well written and articulated, but never have been implemented. So this is a big challenge. And uh, we are starting to talk about integration due to the fact of the arrival of refugees, which is a completely different group of people having different needs. And so we have, for example, the old migrants complaining that since we are here, you never did anything for us, so now you're doing everything for the refugees, and what about us, etc., etc. This is a big debate between 
um, between the state authorities and the municipality and the migrant communities. So this is a challenge how to combine these two different groups and in the same time work with the hosting community uh, that faces the eighth year of a big financial crisis and uh, uh, important austerity measures. I'm not saying that we have to blame everything to the Troika or the memorandum, but this is a context. And we have to keep it in mind that we are working into a different set of programs, problems and uh, challenges. So we need to combine all of this to sustain uh, social cohesion, which is the next big policy of the city of Athens. It's, you know, it's an ongoing process. I don't have a lot to say on it, but hopefully we will be uh, proceeding with that. That's it. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And is, is this too loud sometimes? Yeah. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for having this discussion, which I find very interesting because absolutely I agree that we have different uh, mindsets, but also different realities in our cities. And before I answer your question on the practical level of what actually I would say is the biggest challenge, and I think it depends on who you're asking, also from the municipality of Vienna, and at what moment in time you're asking the question, you know, depends, that, that, that will uh, influence the answer that you're getting. But before I come to that level, I would like to really say that I think the biggest challenge that we're facing are the, um, is the political frame that we have. Because we have a specific political situation in Vienna because of the political parties that are in power or in charge or are in the government. And this is since uh, the last election that was in October 2015, so since November, that's when we started, that's also when I started uh, my work, since November 2015, which is a very crucial moment, I think, we have a coalition of the Social Democratic Party and the Green Party. And we have an agreement, and this agreement in the area of integration has one title, and that title is called Integration from Day One. And this is the paradigm under which we are working until the next election. But one of my uh, main concerns and questions is also under the current political situation that we're facing, not only we in Vienna, but all over Europe or globally even, how can we create a situation that is stable and that is sustainable uh, throughout elections and throughout political changes? Because this uh, situation that we have and that we are trying to con cons consolidate currently is because we are committed to the program that says integration from day one. But this is something that um, has a date set to it. And the other point that I would like to raise is that we as a municipality, and Vienna is not only a municipality, we are a province and we are the capital city. So in this role, we are in quite an antagonistic situation relating to the nation state and to the politics on the national level which are very different from what we are doing in the city. And that often we are trying to compensate um, for damage done on the national level. And we are also finding ourselves more and more isolated on purpose by political forces that are trying to boycott also um, the political work that we are doing. And that is possible on two levels. Uh, one is to do that by con uh, constantly um, uh, politically attacking what we're doing. And the other one is on a very practical level through budget, uh, budget cuts and the lack of resources. So the question is also, even if we say integration from day one, which consists of a number of measures, for how long can we keep that up as a city if we do not have support on the national level? or on the contrary, if it is even, you know, counteracted on the national level. And then to just say some words on the actual challenges or measures, I would agree with what, what you said, though the situations are very different, but housing is one of the primary challenges that we are facing. 
So Vienna, as the capital city, has a number of uh, pull, pull factors for refugees who live in different parts of Austria to eventually come to Vienna, which is a very good thing in terms of networking, communities, and also opportunities. But we in Vienna end up with an estimated two-thirds of the refugees in Austria, which is in total numbers around 50 to 60 or maybe 70,000 individuals. So to provide housing for a big group of individuals with a very specific situation is a, an actual challenge and I think that we did not approach that yet uh, as much as we should. inviting Barcelona in this uh, event. Uh, I think most of the audience knows much better uh, the situation of Barcelona perhaps than the situation of the other cities. So uh, I will try to, to explain. First of all, uh, I agree the context situation of, of, of the every state determines quite a lot the, sit the answers on the situations the legal frameworks, for example, are very important in order to see possibilities uh, on, on the strategies on the integration of migrants, refugees, etc. Uh, it's true that uh, I would say Barcelona is more a migrant city rather than a refugee city. If we look in a perspective of what happened here in the last 17 years, uh, the uh, flow of migrants uh, overwhelms the flow of refugees. Okay. Uh, but Maybe. Yeah, I was telling that Barcelona is more a migrant city rather than a refugee city. If we look at the figures of uh, what happened in the city in the last 17 years, the, uh, the number of migrants overwhelms the number of refugees. Although the last two, three years, refugee issues are getting more important and we're getting uh, bigger figures compared with the past, but still, the numbers of migrants coming to our city are much bigger than uh, refugee cities. Afterwards, we will come especially into the refugee issues, but mm -hmm. I would say it's more important for the city, the situation of, of the migration. Uh, which are the challenges? Uh, first of all, I would say there are uh, some challenges that are shared with the rest of the population of the city, which are, for example, I would say, access to housing. Okay, this is affecting everybody, migrants, migrants especially. And because we are living right now, we are experiencing a crisis on the housing market. The, as you know, the prices of the, of the rents are increasing by many factors, the tourism, the speculation, etc. So this is really creating a lot of people uh, evicted, uh, but not uh, pro uh, owners, but people who, who has rents, okay? And they become homeless. And this is affecting all the services of the city. Migrants are really affected by this ph new phenomenon, and it's, it's a, a priority of the city. Also, another shared uh, challenge is the access to work. We still have a very high unemployment rate compared with other cities in Europe. Maybe compared with other cities in Spain, not so high, but if we compare with Europe, we still have a high unemployment. If we speak specifically, on what are the challenge, uh, according to my opinion of, uh, of the immigration, uh, we have one set of, of priorities, which is access to legality of many migrants. We have still have an important number, number of migrants who live in our city in irregular status. Okay, it's a few, few thousands, 10 thousands more, and they live in a re irregular status. So our priority is to provide them legality status and to provide them help to uh, get uh, legal uh, permission, or resident permission and work permits. So this is one set of priorities. Uh, if we look at what happened in the last years, another set of priorities is real equal opportunities in the job market. If we analyze and we see what are migrants are working on, what type of industries, what uh, type of, of work are doing, we see that are quite in the lower scales of, of, the, of, of the qualifications. So 
are we really uh, giving opportunities to migrants to, uh, to uh, you know, with social mobility? I, I don't think that much. There's a crystal ceiling in the job market for many migrants, and I think this has to be breaked, okay? And also, this is also related with the education, okay? Also, we are seeing not very good indicators on how migrant children are performing, uh, what we call uh, ch children of migrants, second generations, that's so-called, and the uh, indicators are not so good in the school. We have a problem with segregation in school in the city, we have a problem in, in uh, access to post-obligatory uh, uh, education, access to university or uh, better degrees, and there's here, it's, it's a big inequity between migrants or uh, citizens of Barcelona with migrant uh, origin and the rest of the population. And this really is jeopardizing the future of the city. I think this is something that we have to keep in mind. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, explain that I think we have a, an interesting asset or positive thing is that historically in our city we had political consensus on the, on the issue of immigration policies. Since 2002, all the political parties from the left and from the right more or less had the will to agree in some basic uh, policies, okay? And, and this has really helped uh, the professionals who are dealing with the, with the policies to, to have like a stable uh, uh, context. And, uh, we, we haven't had these discussions on, on the public uh, uh, opinion, on, like in other countries like Austria or like Holland, and I think this is something positive. At least in, in Barcelona we have this uh, very, very uh, positive attitude by most of the parties that really had helped to this uh, process. The situation in Milan uh, is uh, similar to the other cities. I don't know if... Uh, okay. And um, uh, the, the main uh, challenges uh, we have are um, more or less the same uh, of, my, of the other colleagues. But uh, I will say that uh, in Milan is more a city of refugees because uh, refugees are becoming more and more interest of uh, politicians. And so we are more, um, um, more engaged in uh, facing uh, the problems uh, linked to the accommodation of refugees uh, instead of working on integration of migrants. Uh, this is, uh, of course, a pity, but uh, uh, I will say that uh, uh, this is um, uh, also because uh, the, um, the media, uh, the communication, uh, the, the press uh, um, is... Um, uh, um, is, is going to uh, wants to know more and more how we uh, we have to um, how we spend our money for uh, refugees, and that's why we are now uh, concentrate our works on uh, um, looking for accommodation of refugees, and this is uh, the main uh, challenge in Milan, because uh, um, unfortunately there are less accommodation sites, but we have, uh, of course, uh, uh, a problem linked uh, to, the, uh, to the lack uh, of housing uh, in the cities because uh, uh, Milan is a big city uh, but uh, a lot of people coming uh, from South uh, Italy are families uh, and uh, uh, are big families. Uh, that means uh, that uh, they have got uh, 10, uh, uh, 12 uh, children with them and uh, in Milan uh, we are not able to find uh, apartments for uh, so big uh, families. And this is uh, a, a big, uh, big problem we are now facing. And then another problem linked to the refugees is also uh, mental diseases, uh, uh, because these people, uh, in, the, in the last uh, six months, uh, people were coming uh, from. Uh, 
from from the south uh, um, are um, have got uh, um, a lot of uh, are vulnerable uh, people people with mental diseases uh, and uh, we are um, uh, we are not uh, prepared to uh, to face this uh, this big uh, issue and of course uh, um, uh, there are, uh, as um, my colleagues uh, told you, uh, we have uh, got uh, some uh, challenges uh, linked to the education of uh, migrants, uh, people who live in Milan, uh, and uh, especially second generation, uh, because uh, um, also as a city, we are, as I told you before, we are more concentrate on uh, refugee, uh, on refugees uh, accommodation and. Uh, uh, and problems linked to this uh, um, category, and uh, we we are uh, in the last uh, uh, six months we are working uh, less uh, on uh, migrant uh, integration, and I think uh, uh, we we should uh, be uh, more um, engaged in uh, uh, facing uh, also uh, the and giving the opportunity to migrant fa families uh, uh, living in Milan. Uh, to have uh, better condition uh, in schools uh, and uh, in uh, in job because of course the other big challenge uh, is uh, having a job uh, having work because there is uh, no work uh, opportunities uh, also for italian people thanks and now shifting to the specific situation of asylum seekers and refugees what is their situation uh, what did it change after 2015, and what is and and what is changing now? What has happened since then? Yes. Um, first of all, I have to remind you some figures just to have in in mind what happened in 2015. Approximately one million people crossed the borders from Turkey to the islands to the Greek islands, then from the islands to the port of Piraeus, the port of Athens, and then the trip to the north through the Balkan route, etc., etc., going up to Germany, usually. <coughs> um, since March 2016, as you all know, this route was closed, uh, borders were uh, fenced, uh, and uh, the, this road officially closed. This created a, a blockade, a blockade uh, and people were stranded in Greece, the, uh, let's say around 60,000 people, this is not a big number, in the context of, of any country, um, but it's a problematic situation because people want to move and they cannot. Trust me, they still find ways to move, illegally of course, but I have to remind you that the previous situation was also illegal, because people say that Greece didn't go, do a good job um, uh, handling uh, the movement of people, etc., but I have to remind you that all the European countries, all the member states of the EU, had their borders open and we're letting people pass, and this is a violation of the treaties, so this is not only a Greek problem. Um, what changed is that the asylum service has become more effective, so uh, the procedure takes less time. Um, we are under a new scheme which is called the relocation scheme, meaning some uh, nationalities have the right to move legally to Europe, uh, especially Syrians and some other smaller uh, ethnicities. Um, and we are we have a second group of people, the people who entered after the, the EU-Turkey deal, as we call it, the, this declaration, uh, who are stranded in the islands and uh, don't have a future for the moment, as things are. Uh, they have to wait a, a very long procedure to see if they're going to be given asylum to Greece or they're going to be sent back in Turkey, uh, taking under consideration that this agreement considers Turkey to be a safe third country. I have my doubts <laughs> on it and we can discuss it, uh, but this was a political decision. Personally, I completely disagree. I find that this is a very bad deal. It doesn't work either way, and uh, it's the wrong choice, but okay, it was the only one at that time. Um, so the situation is, I would say, stable under the, the current scheme. Um, I can, no one can say what will happen even tomorrow, actually tomorrow. Um, as you know, the many elections in Europe, Holland, France, Austria, maybe Italy, etc., etc., and last but not least uh, Germany, will affect 
this whole procedure. And until this political situation takes form, I think that we will be in a status quo. Uh, everything will be frozen and we will try to work with the uh, tools that we have, helping people to go where they want to go if they can, or offer them some type of uh, possibility, okay, namely in France, but I think Italy uh, now is a, in a much wor a worse situation than before because the, the route has changed. And we have to take into account these changes because trying to, f uh, how do you say, ha trying to, to, to frame the m movement of people is like trying to stop water from running, which is impossible. So if someone has a better solution, <laughs> please share it with us. Uh, so I think that until the situation is stable, we will continue in that very blurry uh, road, uh, blurry, blurry situation uh, for refugees. Um, but a lot has changed since 2015. I, I'm not sure in which way we are going. That, that cannot answer very um, honestly. Uh, but for the moment, it seems that there is a stability and some, co uh, some procedures are being completed. People are going to Europe. Okay, the numbers are not very high. But to be honest, we don't have that type of numbers. I mean, the deal predicts 66,000 people a year for Italy and Greece. They are not 66,000 people to relocate. So we have to adjust to a new reality. Because people are moving still, and they will move for the years to come. So this uh, reality will change again and again. And what we see now, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We are talking about 1 million people coming into Europe. But we have 65 million people moving all over the world. So 1 million, 65 million, it's, it's nothing. So uh, I think that we've, okay, we reacted into a new reality, but now we have to adapt to this new reality and find a, p a plan that is holistic, integration, European proposal for integration, as, as long as we are talking about the European Union, but also the other countries have to understand that this movement doesn't concern only Europe. So, I mean, refugees walked from Syria to the north of Russia to cross the border with Finland. <laughs> this, is, this is the reality. This is, you know, talking about, no, 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 we don't want them here, we are going to stop them. For me, it's not realistic. So we have to change the, the, this, the, this narrative and to look things from the other way. Um, I, I absolutely agree with what you say that um, so much has changed since uh, 2015 on the political level. It's hard to even describe the changes. Uh, talking from an Austrian perspective, I mean, you didn't mention anyone specifically, but Austria was uh, very involved in closing down the Western Balkan route. And uh, um, those responsible for that were also proud of having done that. So a certain political position and approach uh, consolidated itself. Um, and that was a shift to at least the reception at the very beginning in 2015 where the, um, the civil society involvement was so strong and was so present and where in contrast to some other countries, especially Hungary for example, Austria developed um, a very um, charitable identity as helping, um, as upholding human rights in this situation, but then uh, quickly forgot about that and uh, turned around completely. And um, now m immigration issues, um, asylum issues, uh, refugees, um, um, the, the presence of Muslim communities, um, women's rights, putting all together and mixed together is the <coughs> dominating aspect and theme of the political uh, debates. And on every level, and especially in the context of uh, elections and as a competition between political parties. But unfortunately not in a way to find solutions, not in a way to uh, stress um, 
positive ways of living together or of uh, exchanging, learning from each other, not in the sense that the Viennese model is trying to be, to say integration from day one. Sometimes when I, when I say that or also when I think about it, I'm not quite sure if that is a threat or a promise, but we're trying to you know, interpret it in a positive way as in having possibilities from day one and opportunities from day one and chances from day one and participation from day one and access <coughs> from day one. So in, in this sense, it would be a positive model, but the competition is not for that positive model, but the competition is for more restrictive policies, for anti-immigration policies, um, for creating more fear in the population and um, f for, uh, in, in, in a way, showing strength <coughs> through, um, or, or they think that they are showing strength, through being um, very um, repressive with the policies that uh, are being put forward. So in this sense, also since 2015, we've experienced a number of changes on the legal level, um, from the national legislation, and I, I would like to say that the far right is not in charge, they are not in power yet. So we will have early elections. This was decided just between last week and this week. I don't know if any of you follow Austrian politics in detail, but the vice chancellor stepped down last week and then the former minister of, or there's still, he's still the minister of exterior affairs, the one who's responsible for shutting down the um, routes of, of refugees. Um, he has taken over the Christian Conservative Party and so now the coalition government decided to have early elections. So instead of voting next year, we will have it this year in October, on October 15. And um, so the, the uh, legal changes um, that took place since 2015 were put forward by the Social Democrats and the Christian Conservative Party who until now are in power. So they um, put forward a more restrictive asylum legislation. Um, they put forward um, a so-called integration law or a whole package of integration legislations, uh, which include a number of compulsory measures. So compulsory, compulsory uh, language courses, compulsory value courses, um, a number of mandatory elements um, that are combined with sanctions. So if you do not oblige, if you do not fulfill these mandatory requirements, then the sanctions would be, for example, um, cuts uh, in, on, in social benefits. Um, in general, social benefits for um, refugees, those who already have received the status of uh, refugees, uh, have also been cut in various uh, provinces. So if you would talk to another city, for example, not to Vienna, but to another city in Austria that is governed by different political parties, then their governance and uh, their measures and their realities would be very different, uh, especially for the people living there, than from those in, in Vienna. So we already have this implemented in various provinces that uh, if you access uh, social benefit, or you want to access social benefit, but you, your status is a refugee, but you are recognized legally, you, you know, your case is through, you would get less, just less money, and which is very, very difficult to uh, understand, like how are you supposed to live with less than your neighbor when you're in a similar situation? And uh, maybe just to say two things, one with regards to the housing. Um, the, the difficulty is not only to actually have the, 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 the apartments, the houses, the rooms, the places. In parts we have them, in parts we don't. So in, in parts we have to build more and we have to build faster. And that is the responsibility that we have uh, on the political level. But in parts, the private sector, it, it is very difficult to access if your status is um, a refugee, if your language competence in German language is very low, and if your income is non-existent. 
And these are the elements that are very relevant to the landlords uh, who are renting out and who will in 99% of the cases not rent out to a person um, uh, that fits these criteria. And also responsible for that is a change that's also been taking place since 2015 on the political level, in, on the level of the political discourse about the topic and on the level of the media discourse. Because the media has been constantly, since 2016, since the beginning of the year when the Cologne incidents uh, happened, that uh, you might remember, um, has been constantly painting a, an image of uh, a threat that uh, comes from refugees, uh, of violence, of crimes, um, of aggression. And uh, with these images that are being created and the political discourse that is using this um, as a competitive element in, in the context of, uh, of elections and of just a, a political play, um, it is very, very difficult to create uh, a sense as, or a sentiment of solidarity in which it would be possible for people to rent an apartment even if their uh, current uh, conditions would be difficult. But um, as um, it is so adversal uh, in, in the public um, uh, discussion and debate and in the media, how it is presented every day, we have this very, very difficult situation where we have to provide housing because the private sector can simply or will not um, be doing this. And just to, to finish um, the, my point about the, the relevance of the political frame, when uh, Benjamin Barber asks, uh, so what would uh, the world look like if mayors would be ruling, then I would like to ask, well, from what party? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I will answer this question regarding me specifically to the refugee issue, mm -hmm. because you said what, what you, the question is what happens or what is different uh, since 2015 since the refugee crisis uh, started. First of all, uh, we have to understand the context in Spain and in Barcelona regarding to refugees. Spain historically has been not uh, a country of refugees until 2013-14, the number of applications in the whole country was maybe 5,000, 6,000. So for a 44 million country, it is, the figures are really ridiculous. And uh, above that, 80% uh, of the applications were rejected. So uh, really, the refugee issue, the refugee uh, rights and asylum seekers was uh, not very popular. It was not, nothing uh, really big, so important. It's important, of course, from a qualitative point of view, human rights view. I'm not saying that it's not important. It's very important. But the figures were that when you see it are not, not so, so big. Just to give you some examples, in 2005, 2006, only in the city of Barcelona we received 60,000 people, migrants, in one year. Okay, and the city more or less give an answer and give a respond to that. So the context with refugees is uh, low figures until that. But then uh, we, there was a, a big mobilization, a big... Uh, uh, the civil society really was uh, really shocked uh, because of the, what we were seeing in Greece and in, in, in Syria and the big uh, travel of the people in, 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 in the sea, of the Mediterranean Sea. So there was a big mobilization of the civil society uh, claiming to help uh, Syrians. Okay? I think this was a very positive response by, by the city. We saw a few months ago uh, in the form of a big demonstration. Uh, which uh, really, with a lot of people in the streets claiming for uh, helping uh, the Syrians, refugees in Greece and Italy to, to just to claiming the states to fulfill their agreements. So I think that that was very very interesting. Uh, from the reality, what 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 we have seen in in the city of Barcelona is that the state, uh, you know, it's a competence of the state uh, providing help and uh, a social program for, for refugees, uh, has increased the number of um, uh, uh, rooms and, and uh, 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 the number of positions in the city of Barcelona with the NGOs 
that are collaborating with the state. Okay. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the reality of the refugees in the city it's very different. It's not Syrians. When we talk about refugees, we're talking about conflicts in the world. Okay, and we are, our reality and we are, we are our profile in the city, what we are seeing, is nothing to do with Syria. It's a different phase. We, in the last year, for example, in our service that we uh, attended 2,200 people, 2,200 people, uh, the n number one nationality was uh, people claiming uh, asylum status from Venezuela. Okay, there's many conflicts in the world that have an impact, this globalization, in the city of Barcelona. The first one was Venezuela. The second one was Ukraine. The conflict in Ukraine, nobody talks about it, but still have a very important impact in our city. The third was Honduras and El Salvador. Okay, Pakistan too. And number seven, eight was Syria. This is the reality. So people was expecting to receive by relocation and reubication Syrians, which they did not arrive, very small figures, they have arrived by relocation and reubication. And instead we're having different kinds of refugees. Okay, this is like a paradox. Okay, but it's the reality, and I think they have the same right, a Ukrainian than a Syrian, to claim asylum seeker in Spain because they suffer also persecution and, and, and uh, very severe conditions and where they live. So uh, this is very interesting. Uh, a positive thing is that thanks to this mobilization of the civil society, nowadays there are more sensibility and more uh, knowledge on the law of the refugees. There's more places where we can detect refugees. Very often in the past, many refugees in Spain couldn't have the chance to claim asylum status. They just were treated like mi migrants, and the migrants' law were applied to them. Now there are more NGOs, more lawyers, who know the difference between a refugee and a migrant, and so they can orient it. They can give advice to claim people uh, the refugee and asylum seeker status. So this is a positive aspect. So we have more people claiming refugee asylum status in the city. The figures have really grown a lot, grown a lot. And uh, the bad news is that we are doing by ourselves with any communication and any contact with the administration who is competent on that, which is the state administration. Okay, the state administration they deal with NGOs who act in our city. They send people here. They have a program who, can, who, they, who people can access, but we don't know how many. We don't know where. If you ask me, Ramon, how many refugees are in Barcelona? Truly speaking, I don't know. Nobody knows. I don't think even the minister knows. We can get some estimations, okay? We can get some estimations, but the reality is that that we don't know. Working in these conditions is very, very difficult. So what do we do from the municipality? So we try to fill the gaps because the program, the accessing the program of the state is uh, sometimes complicated, especially if you're not vulnerable. You, and uh, there's a lot of people who is left behind and who is not in the program because the mobility they, want, they don't want to accept, mobility to other places in Spain. They, so at the end they stay here, and the city at the end provides shelters somehow and uh, fills the gaps with, uh, especially in the beginning of the process and also after the process, after the state program is finished and people are not autonomous, they don't have uh, a job and they need, they need help. So there's the city providing some uh, programs that I will, I will explain later. But I, I would like to just to give you one very important idea. Uh, most people in Barcelona said, oh, where are the refugees? Ramon, where are the refugees? They are not arrived. No, they are not arrived. Ramon, where are the refugees? Said, no, no, they are arrived. But they are Ukrainians, they are Venezuelans, they are from other countries. So please tell your uh, people you know that yes, we have many refugees in Barcelona from many other conflicts. Maybe we don't have so many Syrians, but we have other refugees 
refugees have arrived. Last year in, uh, in Sire, which is a place where we help people, we attend migrants and, and, and refugees, we attended 2,200 people claiming uh, asylum seeker. Mm -hmm. The situation in Milan is similar to Barcelona. Uh, because uh, the big change uh, we had uh, was uh, in uh, 2013 because uh, there, were, there was a big number of uh, Syrian families and people, people um, coming from, from Syria and uh, the, uh, Milan changed uh, its way of facing this problem because uh, uh, Milan was at first um, a city of uh, transit for refugees and now it's uh, no more a city of, of, of transit because uh, the most of uh, people coming uh, from uh, the south of Italy are now staying in Milan and uh, are um, asking for um, uh, um, as a, asylum uh, seekers, are becoming asylum seekers. And so uh, we are now changing from uh, um, an emergency situation uh, uh, in a, a normal situation. I mean, um, at the beginning, uh, we, we just uh, provide them accommodation and meals. Uh, but from uh, the last uh, year, uh, the, the, uh, the people who are coming uh, are staying in Milan, and so uh, the, the big challenge is now uh, trying to integrate them and giving them not just accommodation and meals, but also all the services. And this is, of course, a big issue. And another, uh, another transformation is about the way people uh, are uh, looking uh, to, to these uh, asylum seekers, uh, because uh, uh, in 2013, uh, the Milanese people were all uh, involved in the accommodation like in Barcelona because uh, they, uh, they wanted also to host these people coming from Syria. Now uh, we have less people coming from Syria and more people coming from Eritrea, and so we do, we don't find uh, the, the people um, open to uh, to host them, like uh, because the people fear uh, refugees, feel fear that uh, a lot of uh, uh, people are coming from uh, South Italy and are not able uh, to move uh, to, to the northern of uh, Europe uh, and that's why they, they are uh, not more uh, involved in helping them and so uh, you, uh, there is uh, this, uh, this fear uh, that uh, uh, you can uh, um, you can see, you can, uh, uh, it's, it's really um, a, ch a, big, uh, a big change that, uh, that is going on. Thank you. Uh, asylum is a competence of the national state, but as I said at the beginning, the cities, and as you are explaining now, the cities are the ones dealing or the, dealing more directly with the arrival of asylum seekers and their integration. So, could you explain us what's exactly the role of your municipality in uh, asylum and refugee reception policies and how is how the relationship between the national and the local level work in each case? Mm. First of all, I have to remind something that has been said. It's not our competency. So, uh, we don't have anything to do in a, in, a, in a typical way with refugees and migrants, not even in, with reception or integration, just to be clear. But the lack of national policy obliges the cities to be present. So there is a political choice to be made here, and the mayor of Athens has done it. Uh, we either stay on the sideline watching things happening, or we either participate and be, and uh, we are more active and uh, offer possibilities. So we chose to participate. <laughs> that has, you know, that has positive and negative uh, sides. Um, you know that 
and now I'm speaking as a politician, when you deal with people, you never win. Win brackets. I mean, I'm, I'm, the reality is you, you always win, but politically it's a very difficult uh, political choice to make. Um, so the first thing that we did is to collaborate with them in the ministry in order to open the first reception center in, uh, in Athens that hosts around 2,000 people uh, since August 2015. And uh, then, we went, moved, then we moved on to the second step, offering temporary housing for asylum seekers and uh, relocation beneficiaries. Uh, there is a big program through UNHCR with uh, money from the European Commission to offer housing uh, apartments, I mean, uh, to people who are waiting to be relocated. And now, slowly, we are opening the program to people who ask for asylum and are going to stay in Greece. Um, now we have to move on to the third step, as I mentioned before, uh, to offer social housing for refugees, recognized refugees. Unfortunately, this is very difficult, and uh, because if you don't have a social housing program for the hosting community, you cannot have a social housing program for refugees. Imagine if we offer uh, housing to refugees and leaving out uh, homeless Athenians. It would be a disaster politically and practically also, uh, and, it, and it's not fair. So this is also a difficult political decision to make. And we are waiting for a plan, and this is one of the things that, as municipality, we are doing. Um, the, the ministry um, announced the plan for 2017 and 2018 in broad lines. Uh, and after that date, we will have to find the solutions on our own, without any type of support from UNHCR or other organizations. So this is one of the things that we have to do. We have to be prepared for the next two years, what we will do after. And that's why we collaborate with cities that have more experience than us and try to find solutions in matters that we never dealt with before. So this is the inexperience of a society is very important and it's coming back as a, as a very important political uh, challenge. Because as Maura said, uh, there is a change in the perspective. Uh, and Ramon said that people were waiting for Syrians because people thought that the only refugees in the world are Syrians because they saw these dreadful images of people being bombed, etc., etc. But this been, is been happening for many, many years. And do, you don't have only Syrians. I mean, the hypocrisy of that debate is that, I have to remind you that uh, you, the European policy changed when we had the picture of the young Ilan in the shores of Turkey, where all the big press came out saying, this is a disgrace. Yes, but you had kids died who died before, and you had kids who died after. This is not the only point of reference. Unfortunately, this is the way we are doing politics in the, in the modern days. We take a picture and suddenly everything changes, which is not true for me. This, this, and it's very hypocritical to do that type of policy. Um, you had the British Prime Minister coming out and saying, this is a disgrace, we have to do something. And then, a few months later, Britain decided to take less unaccompanied minors because, I don't know, for whatever reason. So, the, the way to do the, to, 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 to handle these things has to be a bit more serious. Um, so for us as a municipality is in this context, which is very, co very complicated and it doesn't concern only Athens, we are not the center of the world, uh, is to find solutions for the future. You know, we handled the emergency situation, we found some type of solution for the you know, the short term, now we have to look at the long term. The long term is e every time is more difficult because as Faika said, if there is another mayor in 2019, which is more conservative, for example, all these policies will stop, probably. I don't want to, uh, to predict, but probably these things will change. And this is not something that, can, uh, that doesn't offer a possibility for a sustainable policy. Things that we do now will affect the city five, ten years later. So we have to be ready and we have to understand what these challenges mean. Unfortunately, we are always looking at the short term, tomorrow and in three months, and we don't think about the future. So this is a very big debate, and uh, I think we are doing a pretty serious work in order to show what a, sp a responsible municipality should do, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, allow us to be sure that the next one, uh, or even the next one from the next one, will follow in, the, in, those, uh, in that path. So it's, um, it's an ongoing process. 
So, yes, absolutely. I think it is a, a question of political will. And uh, the relationship between the provinces in Austria and the national level is very complex. And I do not want to bore you with the details of why we are blocking each other constantly and basically are working against each other or in competition to each other. But un unfortunately, there never was this moment when we all came together, let's say, all the provinces or the national level and the provincial level or the cities or the municipalities. And, and we said as an agreement, this is a challenge that we're all facing and let's work on this together. This just never happened. So we are still in disagreement for political reasons. Um, and so in this complexity, Vienna, because of the political situation that we currently have, decided to do the best that we can, or what we think is the best or good. And that means doing more than uh, is uh, foreseen on the national level, and not waiting for the measures from the national level. So, one element that is in the national uh, decision and competency is the distribution, the regional geographic distribution of refugees that come to Austria. And even in that, some of the provinces do not fulfill the so-called quota uh, of you know, welcoming or receiving uh, the couple of hundred uh, refugees that would be their quota. So at some point Vienna, for example, then said that uh, because this, there was a situation that was unbearable in a camp, that Vienna would take all unaccompanied minors. 300, I think, at that time, and the mayor just said, we will take them. You know, let's, let's stop this. This is what, what are we doing here? So we can do things like that, where we do not wait for a national decision or the, the competency might not be very clear or might not be on the national level. What we also did was, because, I mean, we have um, a, a history of immigration to Austria since decades. So in Vienna, for example, uh, depending on how, what statistical reading you use, but uh, half, almost half of the population has a migration background. So that would mean either they themselves or w at least one of the parents are born in another country. So almost half the population, and if you go with the younger, um, around 17, it's even more, it's, uh, it's almost two thirds. So uh, migration and integration approaches, uh, concepts, discussions have been um, a, a regular element of our political work and of the, the measures that we're uh, making. So what we did first when we had also, as, uh, as you said uh, before, uh, um, emergency solutions, mm -hmm. we used the measures that already existed and were in place and expanded them. So we already had German language courses going on, so we had to offer more of them. Uh, we had to staff up some of the things that we're already running, orientation courses, for example. So just like enlarging uh, what we already were doing and luckily what we had been doing was not so bad and was not so off track. And then we can think about additional elements that we would like to introduce or how we would like to actually steer what we're doing so it's not just like happening to us, but so that we know what we're doing and what we want to be doing, which then uh, our leading idea is then to say this uh, title of integration from day one and please translate it into possibilities from day one, options from day one, access from day one. And one example, to give you one example maybe, uh, Vienna applied for an EU funded uh, project which uh, we also got and it's uh, called uh, CORE, Core, Core uh, and which is short for Center of Refugee Empowerment and it is 80% EU funded and has a total budget of 6 million euros. And uh, it's already started and it will be an actual place um, because when you said house, uh, house of reception, we didn't have anything like that physically yet, but now we will have an, an actual building that is not only offering courses or classes or formation or training, but also offers the possibility for self-organization and should be a place of actual empowerment. And I think that that is a strong signal on the symbolic level when a municipality says the title of a project that we're doing is Center of Refugee Empowerment. 
And I think these are the things that, you know, um, initiatives that municipalities can do or cities can do and take, uh, regardless of, um, of the role that we might have or the limitations that we might have from the national level. Um, but it is a question of resources also at, at the end of the day and of funding. And uh, here now with this example, luckily, um, it was funded by a, a third uh, partner, so to say. Um, and, and the other uh, part that we rely on heavily is civil society. So that is also something I think that m cities can do, is the sentiment in the population. What are we doing? What we try to do is to create spaces where people can meet, where the population can meet and exchange, but then the, ex the actual exchange uh, has to take place by those involved. And civil society has been uh, uh, very, very important and uh, made such a great contribution and is actually still doing it, uh, whether it is with regards to housing or with regards to um, just uh, general support. And I think without uh, the contribution of civil society, um, no integration uh, policy could succeed. Okay, uh, I will stick to strictly to the question, which mm -hmm. was the, uh, uh, the the according to uh, the accommodation facilities for asylum seekers, a competence of national state. What is the specific role of municipalities, mm -hmm. etc.? No, uh, for for our city, you have to understand first how the system works. Uh, otherwise. The system is first state competence, okay? Our mayor has, for example, asked for uh, the, uh, competence for the local level in refugees and the vice mayor of the government two times in the press conference every Friday, they do after the minister's conference, have stated very clear, city of Barcelona, don't mess with refugees, this is our competence. She has said that two times, okay? So we don't have competence. We don't have competence according to the state. So it's a, a exclusive competence of the state. So how the, work, uh, how the system works? The state has to provide a social program for all uh, asylum seekers. But of course the state, they don't have social workers. So what do they do? They, they, they contract NGOs, okay? They have several NGOs like the Red Cross, THEAR, ACTHEM, different NGOs, okay? And they are the ones who uh, deploy the, uh, the, and they provide accommodation for asylum seekers, okay? So, uh, one of these NGOs is the Red Cross, is in charge in our city to be the main gate to access the state program. So everybody in Catalonia, not only in Barcelona, in the province, but in all Catalonia, who comes by its means and wants to claim asylum seeker and wants to enter the social program from the state, has to go through the Red Cross. And the Red Cross is in within of a municipality facility, which is the SIRE, which is the main hub for migrants and refugees. So the gateway to the state program in Catalonia is in our facility of the municipality. Okay, this is very important. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's the Red Cross on behalf of the state. Okay, so they have to follow what the state says and they are financed by the state. What happens if you arrive to the city of Barcelona on a Friday night and you are a asylum seeker and you knock to the door of the state, he said, I want to claim asylum seeker status, please give me accommodation. They won't find any door open until Monday morning. So where they should sleep? Should they sleep in the streets with little children? Of course not. The city takes care. We have facilities for social emergency and we take care of these people until we try to uh, take them to the door of the state. But the door of the state is very narrow, and sometimes there's a big queue. So if you are in a vulnerable status, you probably are attended immediately. If you are not, you have to wait weeks, sometimes months. Okay? And these people are left without accommodation. 
Okay, so some of these people at the end, we have to take care of them with our expenses. And we do it, okay, of course. So this is very important. The system is not working. The system is a disaster from our point of view. I'm not criticizing the NGOs. The NGOs are professionals. They have good professionals. They do the best and they are, they do, they are good. But how is organized? The system is very inefficient, okay? So uh, we have the sire, which is the main, it's a door. So people can just open the door and ask, I'm a asylum seeker, I want advice. So we provide advice, legal advice also, to claim the asylum status for free to them. And we orientate on this bureaucracy, really, really red tape issue, which is very complicated. We do this since 1989. Since 1989, we do the legal advice for refugees in the Sire. It was created originally for refugees because we had the crisis of the refugees of Argentina, Chile, of the Latin American countries, dictatorships. And we had an issue here, so we create this facility. At the beginning, very small for refugees. Afterwards, it changed to migration because migrants were more important. But still, we provide if you answer, what do we do? We, we provide legal assessment since ages, since 1989, okay? We provide accommodation for those who are in the beginning of the process, left behind or cannot access immediately to the state program because we cannot, uh, we cannot bear having children sleeping in the streets. It's ridiculous. We don't have any finance by the state for that. For that. We're expending hundreds of thousands in pensions and hotels and we don't have any finance. This is taxpayers from the city of Barcelona who are doing that. Apparently, the ministry don't, doesn't want to know what, what we are doing, but we are, we are doing that. And, and we are doing much many other things. For example, at the end of the process, after one year and a half of the state program, when it finished the state program, many people is not, they don't have a job, they are not able to live by themselves, so they are left in, in the city. So uh, we have two options here. One is just to address them to the social services, like any other citizen of the city, and see what the social services can do, okay? Or if they are in a really, really vulnerable condition, we have a special program for these people. It's a bridge program, we call it, that it takes for one year, these people, in order to see if they can it's a complementary program of the state program, also with our, our uh, uh, money and finance. Also, we have a big problem, is the rejections of the asylum status. So many people during this process are rejected. So they have to leave the facilities they are by themselves and get in the, in the streets. So we also have to see how we deal with these people. They become irregular migrants immediately. So this is an issue also. And then we have many, many other situations. For example, many, other, many asylum seekers who have claimed asylum seekers in other provinces of Spain, but they are sent to Jaén or Granada or Córdoba and they say, well, what I'm doing here, I want to go to a big city. So by themselves, they come to Barcelona out of the program and they knock to our door, say, I'm a asylum seeker, uh, I want to be in Barcelona, I want to a job here, what can I do? And well, the situation is not so good because of this uh, social crisis we're having. So sometimes we also have to deal with this. So as I told before, the, the city is filling the gaps of this inefficient system that we are having. And without any communication, who is responsible of the managing the system and with the advice of the vice prime minister of not doing nothing. What should we do? We should get all these people and take it to the uh, government delegation in, in Street Mallorca and put them there and said, here, you are the competent, do it by yourself. Of course, we cannot do that. We have responsibilities. And we are doing a lot and mm, sometimes we are not doing enough. And we are now, sometimes people are left alone and we have problems too because some people are not well attended. So this is a very, very complicated situation and difficult to manage. So, but this is a reality. Well, the situation in Milena uh, is um, 
difference, uh, I mean, uh, um, the, the competence is a uh, national competence. But uh, in Milan, we, we found uh, a solution that means that uh, we are working uh, quite well with uh, the national uh, territorial governance, gov uh, government. And uh, we, we, we did, uh, we've signed an, uh, an agreement. And through this agreement, uh, we are now involved as a um, Milan municipality in the uh, accommodation of uh, asylum seekers. And uh, in fact, uh, we, in this agreement, uh, we hosted uh, 1,200 uh, asylum seekers. Uh, and we signed this agreement um, at the end of uh, 2015 because uh, the, the government uh, noticed that it was impossible for, uh, for him uh, to, to, fo to face uh, the, the big uh, number of asylum seekers. As I told you before, there was this change and so pe people were no more in transit, uh, so they stayed <laughs> here in the city and uh, uh, the, the state uh, mm, invited uh, us uh, to, to cooperate in order to, to host these people. But, and then uh, in, in, in Italy there is also a, a system called uh, SPRAR. I don't know if you, if you know uh, what is it. SPRAR is uh, a system for uh, the protection of asylum seekers and refugees. And uh, this uh, system uh, has been created uh, in uh, 2002, I think, uh, from uh, the Italian National Association of Munip Municipalities, uh, because uh, uh, the, um, there was the need that uh, um, the, the municipalities were, uh, had to be more involved in uh, um, projects uh, regarding uh, asylum seekers uh, and refugees. That means uh, that uh, municipalities in Italy uh, can uh, um, present uh, a project uh, to, to this inside this system, uh, can apply for, uh, for having uh, money, money come, come from, uh, from the national, uh, from the state, uh, from the Italian uh, government, uh, and uh, the municipalities uh, can arrange uh, uh, projects uh, for asylum seekers and refugees. Milan, Milan decided to, uh, to split uh, the projects in two parts. Uh, one project uh, with the local uh, territorial uh, government uh, through this agreement I told you before and then another project for 414 refugees uh, through uh, funds, national funds coming from uh, this uh, system for asylum seekers uh, and refugees. Uh, the big difference uh, between uh, the two types uh, of uh, um, system is that uh, uh, the territorial government uh, gave uh, uh, money just for accommodation uh, and not for projects. Uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, regarding uh, asylum seekers uh, uh, that are hosted in, uh, in accommodation centers. Instead, on the other hand, uh, through SPRAR, we are able to, uh, to write and to do uh, projects together with people who are uh, in accommodation centers or uh, in, uh, in other types of accommodations, for example, in uh, families, uh, we have got uh, 20 refugees uh, uh, accommodated uh, in, uh, in families in Milan, and also in, uh, in apartments, uh, in, uh, in small apartments. Uh, uh, th this is not possible uh, in uh, um, with as asylum seekers uh, who are uh, hosted uh, just uh, in, uh, in camps, in accommodation camps. Mm -hmm. 
but I, I, I think that uh, uh, we are now quite satisfied uh, because uh, we are uh, trying uh, to, uh, to work together. Uh, we meet uh, with uh, our territorial government uh, uh, two, two times uh, in, uh, in a month and uh, we, we also uh, create uh, scenarios uh, on uh, the, the future, um, the, the possible uh, um, coming of, of uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers. So I, I think that uh, if uh, it's, uh, it goes so uh, as it, uh, it's going uh, on, it will be um, possible to give uh, refugees and asylum seekers uh, a future in Milan. Thank you. I think that it's now time to open the discussion. We have 20 minutes for questions, for comments. We can collect some comments and questions and then we can answer all of them together. And maybe if you can introduce yourself first. Thanks. Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Magali Fricode from um, United Cities and Local Governments. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Committee on Social Inclusion, Participatory Democracy and Human Rights. And I've had, had the chance to work with uh, Barcelona and uh, also with Vienna on the human rights cities. Uh, a little bit with Milan also on the uh, Cities Against Racism Network. And I was wondering to what extent um, the networks of cities are really because we we hear a lot about uh, uh, cities welcoming refugees and 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 I have the impression that it is more a communication effect uh, than a reality and I wanted to know to what extent cities at international or maybe inter-European level can effectively get organized so that they can improve uh, the capacity of, of welcoming uh, refugees. Uh, at, at UCLG, we, are, we have a project of exchanging. Um, we are, it's, a, it's a European subsidy. Uh, we are, we are uh, doing a project with nine European and Mediterranean cities. Uh, Madrid, Lisbon, Tangiers, Tunis, Vienna, Amman, Beirut, um, and uh, Turin also and Lyon on exchanging uh, on practices for inclusion of migrants at local level and uh, it's uh, very concrete workshops on housing, social cohesion and, and, and also we have some uh, pilot project facilities so it is a very concrete project willing also to support the capacity of uh, uh, advocacy uh, so that as local government we can ask at European Union uh, to, to the, the possibility to directly receive the funds uh, for inclusion of migrants. But out, I don't know, I, I heard a lot of experience of, uh, no, of, of networks of cities, but, but I don't know what, what is the effectivity of all those networks. And uh, do you concretely work with them? What can we do within a network to strengthen the capacities of local governments to welcome migrants, and not only refugees, migrants? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Elena Sanchez from CDOP. I have many questions, but I'm, I'm going to focus only on two. Uh, the first one is related with uh, when we, with your first uh, with the first question that uh, uh, that Blanca asked you related with which are the main challenges. Of course, you didn't have time enough to explain all the challenges, but most of you have focused on those challenges that are not very different in terms of when you are dealing with 
migrants in general. You are focused on housing, you are focused on labor market. Only probably uh, Maura mentioned about uh, psychological disease and, 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 and so on. But uh, I would like to focus on, on those uh, challenges that are different from the. So I would like to ask you about uh, could you explain us a little bit about which are those challenges that are different when we are dealing with migrants in general? Because, uh, I mean, I'm sure that there are many more, I'm thinking some of them, but, uh, but I would like if you can explain us a little bit what you are doing in terms of differences when you are dealing with refugees and, and not with, with migrants in general. And the second question, um, do any of you have uh, any experience in terms of participation? Because I know what you, some of you have explaining uh, um, and you're focused on housing, but any of you have experience in terms of a, um, work or in terms of, a, um, of um, yeah, to, to work with other levels in order to, uh, I don't know, for instance, design plans or uh, thinking about uh, how to deal with migrants. I'm talking about uh, governmental levels. That's, that's the quest two questions. Thank you. Thank you. John? I'm John Slocum. I'm a visiting researcher here at CDOB. Um, and my question is a bit related to the first one in terms of the capacity for cities to engage in advocacy, but it has to do specifically with public opinion and whether in your cities there have been focused efforts to, to change public opinion and have you seen successes in that regard? And if so, do those successes have impact beyond your cities at the national level? Uh, yes, on the, on the first question, I will let also uh, Ramon speak in more details, but all four cities here are members of the same network, so the EuroCities network. And all four cities also are part of the Working Group on Integration and Migration. Ramon is an ex-president, I'm the vice president and now Milan was the previous vice president, so we are all basically collaborating in many, many levels. And advocacy of cities in that level works fine. And it's getting even better. Um, I remember two years, when I, two years before when I started, and I can see what is happening now, the change is huge. And one of the, the reasons why is that I will talk only about the Commission, for example. The Commission of the Europe, in the European Union understood that without the cities they can do anything. So in the beginning when cities were asking about participating in the strategy, participating in the dialogue, no one uh, gave them a light of day, nothing. There was no, uh, there was no concern about cities. Um, a year ago, the Commission called the cities to organize a debate the cities would organize and she would participate. So this is a huge shift. So from letting the cities out, giving them the first role. So this is, this, it's working. Uh, but I will leave Ramon to, to explain it more because he has more experience. Uh, concerning the questions um, concerning the, about the challenges. Of course, we have challenges with people who have trauma from the war, uh, people who don't have access to legal advice, people who have uh, no access to specialized uh, medical procedures, etc., etc. But this is, yes, of course, every day. And it's, I, I think that this will get worse by, you know, every, every in the future, because we don't have the capacity to cover a big part of the population. Um, so, for example, in, in Athens, for the first time, we are organizing a service that will provide legal service and psychosocial support to migrants and refugees, of course, even if it's not in the scope of the, of the center. But it's the first time in uh, ever that is happening in Athens and in other municipalities in Greece. This is a new thing. It's, it's, it's a big change. Before, we didn't have any specific service for migrants or refugees. Now we are going to have a small, but for the first time, an existing service. So this is, uh, but I agree with Maura that some 
cases that are very complicated, we can do so much, unfortunately. And the problem is that since the state or the municipalities do not act upon it, as Ramon said, we have NGOs doing this. But my fear, for example, for Athens is that in the next two years, the NGOs will leave and they will go to the next crisis area, which is understandable. That's why NGOs exist. So everything that is happening now through NGOs has to come to the level of the municipality or the state. And I'm not sure that we can cover the gap. So this is a big question. It's a big if. Uh, and if you combine it with the financial crisis, the lack of money, <laughs> the lack of personnel, then things get more complicated. So I don't have a very satisfactory answer for the moment, but we have to be prepared, as I said before. And the third one was about collaborating. Yes, we have some difficulties as uh, Barcelona has with the central state, unfortunately. Um, we have a ministry on migration which was created last year as an uh, independent ministry. Unfortunately, since then we had uh, four different general secretaries who got office and then resigned because they couldn't handle the pressure and couldn't get along with the minister apparently, which that doesn't concern us, but this is the reality. And uh, multi-level governance sometimes doesn't work. <laughs> it's a good thing to, to have it, but sometimes it's complicated. And it has to do with the difference of political affiliation. The mayor is not of the ma majority party or some other ideological differences. This is not very serious, but it exists. Uh, so I think that Barcelona has never been, you know, the quite the same uh, issues. And the last question was public opinion. We made a poll. Uh, in January, 54% uh, of the uh, Athenians uh, are feeling safe and uh, do not consider refugees a threat. 72% of them think that it's a good thing for kids to go to school. Uh, but in the same time, concerning the mosque of Athens, which is it's going to open now in the next few days, hopefully, uh, they're divided, 40-40. They think it's not good or they don't mind. So uh, it's, it's, a, 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 it's not good to patronize, the, you know, to be paternalistic towards society, but I think that we have a very immature society concerning those specific issues. We have never done work like you described it, uh, talking about migrants, doing p uh, policy, um, having campaigns, etc., etc. We have to. Uh, and in Athens, we were very lucky up until now, hopefully. Uh, we didn't have any major event. We didn't have a terrorist attack. We didn't have the Cologne incident. We didn't have any of those things. Of course, we had incidents. Of course, we had people who died from cold in this winter. But in the general picture, in the general, um, if you take into account how many people crossed from Greece, nothing happened, nothing at all. Of course. There is the story of the people who attacked Brussels, who passed through the islands of Greece, etc., etc. But this is a security issue. Uh, in in Athens, we didn't have any major event that could shift public opinion. But we cannot always rely on luck on these issues. You have to be proactive, because when the the, the event happens, then it's too late. Public opinion will shift. See what happened in Germany after Cologne. Even though it was not true, there was a shift in public opinion. So. Uh, it's something that you have to work in proactively. Okay, um, I, will, I was told to be short, so I will try to, and I will start from the end maybe, about uh, changing public opinion, and I thought that you said ball, so first I understood ball instead of poll, and I thought, yeah, we also have a ball, <laughs> but I don't know if we did polling, I don't know what the results would be, um, I think bad, bad. But we, have, uh, we actually have a ball, a so-called, it's called refugee ball, if you translate it. It is an NGO initiative, but it is supported by the municipality and it takes place in our city hall. But it has been going on since 15 years. So it's also not uh, something that we came up with newly, but something that we have been doing. And we do a lot of, um, we, we try to have a lot of initiatives and support for civil society through, for example, workshops or seminars to strengthen volunteers, um, to provide information to volunteers, to civil society. We had a reception for volunteers. So 
we try to do these things, and I think that they are actually have effect, but with those people who are somehow conscious of the situation anyways, and are involved in one way or another. But I think it is important to also communicate that we, we, we see them, and we relate to them, and we appreciate what they are doing. At the same time, as a municipality, we cannot actually shift public uh, discourse or, the, or uh, you, you know, public opinion uh, in a considerable way um, when on the national level uh, it is uh, pushed in the exact opposite direction and when the media is contributing to that. So that is something that is very, very difficult and we have not succeeded in doing that so far. Even though the, the mayor of Vienna made very, very clear statements um, and, and took a human rights position very clearly, of course, when we had the election time more than in any other time, because what we would really need is actually a stable political situation that we can work in and are not constantly um, you know, between uh, various uh, opposing uh, political uh, approaches. Um, so on, on that uh, element of cooperation with the various levels or different levels, uh, that is a bit difficult and, and tricky um, as, as municipality, for example, with the national level because of what I explained. Um, but there are, of course, cooperations between the, the political parties and their various groups, which also has an effect then. Um, and also what we do is we offer the Viennese model. So we, we make it very clear what, is the specific, what, what are, are the specifics of the Viennese model. And so we offer that as something that should be implemented nationwide. And uh, we had some part in the design of the new integration package. There are some elements in it, legislative elements, which, are, which actually make sense. And they, they are what we are already doing in Vienna, but transferred to the national level. Uh, so yes, that exists. Uh, with regards to housing, um, I, and there are some, there are some uh, uh, legal or structural differences. Like for example, we do have social housing. Uh, but how do we organize access of refugees to social housing? And there are some restrictions to that. Like, for example, you have to have uh, lived at the same uh, address of registration for at least two years before you can have access to social housing. That is a, a general requirement. But also then for refugees who have a recognized status as refugees. So there are these limitations, but also what I tried to explain earlier is if your status is refugee, then there are certain, um, there is an unwillingness on the side of uh, landlords and in the private uh, market sector to rent uh, uh, their space to you. And that is connected to the public opinion or the, the public sentiment. Um, and I think also responsibility of a very uh, destructive political discourse. And uh, on the first question about the network of cities, um, I honestly, I, I don't even know how many or which networks, city networks, Vienna is part of. Uh, but I am a strong believer in networks and in networks of cities. And especially uh, with the focus on human rights, uh, anti-racism, um, European solidarity, cooperation. And yes, it might be very much on that level of, um, of communication and not so much in the reality of um, cooperation yet, and, and more with elements of capacity building and exchange and best practices. But I think that, and maybe that is a utopia, but I'm actually convinced that the time will come, m maybe within the next 10 years, when we will have the results of all of these networks, and we will have this reality of uh, cities taking on their roles much stronger than they are doing it today. And I would actually love for Vienna to be much more outspoken, more than we already are, and we are a bit, as a human rights city, for example, um, with the geopolitical role that we have, with the Viennese model that I've been praising uh, all evening now. Um, and I think that um, if, if you take on such a role, it can be also something that would encourage other cities to also, um, as, as you said, Ramon, earlier, uh, when you were saying, uh, it's, this is none of your business, so uh, let us deal with this. So to say, 
to define uh, the areas of competence um, uh, in a new way. So I'm, I'm optimistic here. Very quickly, try to respond. Our main uh, way to lobby at European level is the EuroCities network, okay? I think we, we are doing an interesting job. For example, our mayor had the chance to speak directly to different commissioners, Commissioner Ab Abramopoulos or Commissioner Cretu, and uh, explaining that the funding, that it, from the AMIF funding, the AMIF, there's a, a fund for integration of refugees and migrants by the commission that goes to the state members and it should go to the local administrations in many countries in Europe. It's not happening. In Spain, in Greece, in Poland, many other countries. So we have to tell the Commission personally, our mayor, this, you should change this. You should change the regulation. Maybe they, you should earmark a percentage of the funds for the cities directly. We are struggling on that, I think. We, can, we have a good connection there with the Commission. The Commission has good attitude in that way. The problem is the state members. They don't want to change anything. But, and they have the last word of everything. But, well, it's hard how it works right now. We also have uh, achieved that other very important fundings, like the regional funds or the Social European Fund, they have been, uh, they flexible as their uh, requirements. And they are including immigration as a projects of immigration. For example, the new urban I innovative actions that you want, uh, uh, they include uh, immigration pro programs. So that was good. That was done by the regional fundings. So we have creating like a new culture to be more open to these kinds of, of immigration projects from the local government. There's another very interesting uh, initiative, which is the new urban agenda, new European urban agenda. I, know, I don't know if you have heard that. It's very interesting. The commission, the commission find out that uh, if they took in account cities, their policies would be more effective. So okay, it took 20 years to, to get to this conclusion. <laughs> but okay, welcome to the club. <laughs> so it, it, I'm not talking only about immigration, I'm talking about uh, sustainability, transport policies, uh, all kinds of policies, okay, of the European Union. Also, the integration of refugees. So they started a, pro a program which is the new urban uh, strategic partnership, which is interesting. Uh, who is participating? Five cities in Europe, Athens, for example, Berlin, is led by Amsterdam, Barcelona, five states, five NGOs or uh, stakeholders from the civil society, and three DGs from the European Union. So it's the only project I have been participating in the last 10 years where multi-level governance is there. Cities, states, and NGOs, and the Commission. Okay, and we are talking about integration of refugees. The uh, aim is just to have some conclusions and deliver these conclusions to the Commission and to the state members. Okay, it's, it's something. I'm very pessimistic because probably the states will, oh, very, thanks, good job, it's very interesting, and just put, put the conclusions in a draw and they forget. But, okay, it's a place where at least we can meet all the levels and speak and have these different views of the same issues. I think this, this is very, very interesting. And uh, finally, concerning to the public opinion issues, uh, in Spain, I would say uh, the political debate is uh, different than in the rest of Europe. Okay, we are uh, distracted with other political debates like independence or corruptions or things like this. So we're not talking so much, so much about uh, values, European values and things like which is a debate in, in Austria or in, in Holland or in the UK. So this is one thing. Another thing is that maybe we had uh, some, you were asking about uh, policies that have been replicated uh, in other countries, etc. We have. In Barcelona, we are in the inventors or the creators of the anti-rumor policy, which has been replicated all over the world. It's been, yesterday I learned that in Toronto are developing also this, this, uh, this policy. Okay, the, the, the effect of the policy we have to see, but I, I like to think that we have contributed to create a better understanding in the city and to break these prejudices that many citizens uh, have in the, in the city. 
So, um, as a network uh, uh, concern is concerned, uh, we are also in uh, Eurocities. Uh, we, we are also active uh, um, inside I Italy uh, because uh, we are a true SPRAR system. Uh, I explained before, uh, there is uh, a network uh, of uh, cities uh, working on uh, uh, accommodation uh, types, uh, different type, types of uh, accommodation accommodation and there is also best uh, practice exchanges uh, between uh, um, people who are working uh, on uh, immigration uh, teams uh, and uh, we are uh, quite, quite satisfied uh, because uh, it's a national network uh, but it helps uh, us uh, um, exchange uh, best practices uh, and uh, opinion on this th difficult uh, team. Um, about challenges, uh, um, another important challenge uh, I, I forgot uh, to tell you is about uh, people uh, who are uh, who uh, who lose uh, their uh, status, uh, their uh, refugee status. Uh, so they they are uh, not uh, able to stay anymore uh, in housing or uh, in uh, accommodation uh, sites. Uh, and um, uh, Milan is uh, facing this pro project, uh, this uh, problem, uh, um, creating uh, uh, an area, a special area inside uh, the, the municipality, working on uh, social emergencies. And uh, we are now hosting these people who uh, lost uh, everything uh, um, in uh, uh, centers for homeless uh, in order uh, to uh, to give them assistance uh, uh, for a legal uh, for their legal uh, status uh, and try to uh, to to help them uh, um, with their um, uh, papers. Um, and what, what was the other one? The, uh, uh, the cooperation between the, between the different uh, levels. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we, also, uh, we are also uh, working uh, very well together with uh, uh, NGOs uh, and uh, uh, as local associations. Uh, we, we create a, um, a network uh, uh, with, the, with local association uh, who are a member of our projects uh, and uh, they, they participate in, uh, in our project uh, giving uh, uh, refugees uh, and asylum seekers uh, offering uh, language courses uh, and uh, um, also services, social services. And then the last question about uh, public opinion. Uh, we are now trying uh, to uh, to, to make projects uh, and to work together uh, with uh, um, um, families inside the schools. Uh, uh, that means uh, that uh, we are now uh, trying to, uh, to, to, to teach uh, to, uh, to, the, to the young, uh, young people uh, what, uh, what's the difference uh, between uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers, uh, who are the migrants. Uh, uh, migrants uh, are, are not uh, there to, 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 to take uh, their, uh, our jobs away and so on. So we are uh, doing uh, and hard work uh, together with schools uh, in order to, to teach them but as uh, my colleague from Wien uh, told you before, uh, we have uh, to, um, to face uh, the problem of, uh, of media who, who is uh, working uh, against uh, this positive uh, public opinion uh, works we are doing. Uh, because uh, they, they are instrumentalizzare, I don't, I don't know the word in English, sorry. Uh, they are uh, taking uh, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this team for, uh, for policy campaign and so on, uh, and so it's, uh, it's not simple. But I think that uh, through uh, the, pro the last project we, we are now doing uh, together 
together with uh, some uh, 20, these uh, 20 families uh, who are hosting uh, refugees. Uh, there is also a, a small change, but there is a change. We are now organizing on Saturday afternoon uh, um, an, an event in Milan, like you, di you did uh, here in Barcelona. And people are uh, working uh, together with us in, uh, in going uh, in the streets uh, and uh, showing uh, what, uh, what we are doing uh, what, uh, and uh, trying to convince people that they don't uh, have to, to fear these people. Well, thank you. Faika had to leave. She had to take a... It's working? Yeah. A plane in a couple of hours, and since there are many problems in the airport here in Barcelona, she had really to be in time. So let's leave it here, but before we stop, let me just finish by saying that indeed, as Lefteri said, we invited four cities that are very different, are very different in many ways. Uh, their national contexts are very different. The multi-level governance in each country is very different. The migration and refugee realities in each city are also very different in terms of flows, in terms of numbers, in terms of origin. Uh, Ramon said that Barcelona was a city of migration rather than a city of refugees. Maura said that Milan was the other way around, a city mm. of refugees rather than a city of migration. Also, politics are quite different at the local level, but also at the national level. FICA stressed uh, a lot the politicization of immigration and refugees in the case of Austria, which was not the case or is not the case uh, here in Barcelona. But anyway, the key question uh, was what were the main challenges and what is the role of cities um, with regard to asylum uh, policies and refugee reception policies. And in fact, all of you stress housing as one of the biggest problems, also access to work, equal opportunities, um, but about the role of cities, I think that all of you, maybe except Maura, uh, stress the fact that cities are doing what the state is not doing or filling. You said, Ramon, cities are filling the gap. Uh, Maura said, I uh, know, sorry, um, Faika said, they try to compensate the damage that is being done at the national level. You said, uh, Lefteris, that um, the lack of national policies obliges us to be here, to be there. And FIC at the end said as well, we are doing more than what is foreseen, just to be able to cope and to fill all those gaps that the state is not filling, despite the fact that it's a state competence. So let's leave it here. Thank you for coming. We'll have a next seminar on the 7th of July. This will be in Palau Macaya and will be rather on the Sorry, on the state level, with uh, the different ministries, Spanish ministries, also ACNUR, uh, IOM, and we'll have many other seminars till February 2018. Thank you for coming, and thanks you for coming. Thanks.